Good afternoon and welcome to Wind Europe's webinar about digitalization and integrating new technologies in uh, wind turbines. I invite uh, all of you uh, to follow this webinar um, uh, as a movie trailer or something like a free sneak peek of what content will be uh, you can see, you can expect to see and discuss in the upcoming Wind Europe Wind Technology Workshop that will take place in September from 8 to 10 September online. My name is Vasily Kiklonari. Uh, I'm a, a senior analyst in system integration and digitalization at Wind Europe, and I will be moderating uh, the discussion today with my colleague Ivan Komusanac, who is also an analyst in markets and wind energy technology. Hi, Ivan. Hello, Vasiliki, and good afternoon to everyone joining us. Good afternoon. I will introduce you uh, right away to our speakers. So we are here with Marco Buzelato, Head of Global Operation and Maintenance, Wind Predictive Maintenance at NL Green Power. Hi, Marco. Hello. With Eduardo Sanz, Technical Services uh, Product Manager and Ingeteam uh, Wind Energy. Hi, Eduardo. Hello. Uh, with Jose Baripa, Head of uh, Solutions Management at UL Renewables. Hi, Jose. Hi. And with uh, our colleague Lorenzo Morselli, Head of Conference Programs at Wind Europe. Hi, Lorenzo. So, our common goal to for the next one hour is to explore how data and uh, digital tools are reshaping um, wind farm control strategies and how these trends are, uh, are actually changing the wind uh, workforce. So uh, I invite all of you to actually take advantage of your participation in the, in the discussion and do post your questions on our chat box uh, at the right of your screens. So let us start the discussion today with uh, Lorenzo, who will give us an overview of the program of the upcoming Wind Technology Workshop. The floor is yours, Lorenzo. Thank you, Vasiliki. Um, so, as, as this webinar is, is sort of a prequel to, to the workshop in September, I'm going to give you a, a short recap of what you can look forward to. Um, as Vasiliki already mentioned, it's going to be online from the 8th to the 10th of September, and we will look primarily at developments in wind resource assessment and analysis of operating wind farms, two topics that we've been covering in this series for now 10 years. Uh, the first workshop is, was in, in 2011, actually. So, um, in both areas, data is essential and digitalization has become an uh, additional key topic of the workshop and the bridge between uh, the, the pre-construction measurement and modeling and the operational analysis and optimization. And, and digitalization, as, as, Vasiliki, as Vasiliki mentioned, uh, uh, has also transformed the way we, are, we, we do things. Um, and so that's what we'll discuss today. But uh, let's see also what we have in store for, for September. Um, on day one, we'll start with a, a number of uh, potential applications of artificial intelligence to wind resource assessment, operations, and maintenance, and wind power forecasting. Then we'll look at the latest developments in simulations, and then we'll have two breakout sessions, one on measurements uh, with a strong focus on LIDARs, and one on data-driven maintenance. On day two, uh, we'll look at the effects of uh, wind on flow and meteorology, then see different case studies and options to optimize your operations, and then break out for two sessions on control strategies and tools and data sets, before closing with a special session to hear the latest updates from the IEA Wind Task 43 on digitalization. And on day three, we'll have a special session where we'll present the results of the CREAP exercise that stands for Comparison of Resource and Energy Yield Assessment Procedures. Uh, this is an exercise that is uh, uh, still open uh, for participants, but you have until the 28th of June to send in your results. The presentation will be followed by an interactive discussion on the use and pros and cons of time series. And we will close with the latest developments on our understanding of how climate change is affecting the wind resource and what this means to our industry. We'll take you through all of this with 50 expert speakers representing all parts of the supply chain, from OEMs and utilities to technology and software providers and research institutions from all over the world. And in addition, you'll have the opportunity to meet over 100 posted presenters from an even wider scope of companies and regions the novelty this time around, each poster will be supported by a video presentation and you'll have the opportunity to exchange directly with each uh, presenter thanks to the networking platform swap card that we'll be using for the events. 
the whole community will be there so we really hope to see a lot of you in september registrations are now open um so don't wait and uh that's enough of me talking i'll just uh say thank you to our main sponsors and our green power and ul for making this possible and hand back to vasiliki and ivan and our distinguished panel of speakers for some exciting presentation thank you thank you lorenzo uh now it will be me who's gonna give a short uh short introduction of of a couple of things that we see uh uh from, in, from our perspective happening in the in the in the wind sector uh, uh just a second until i uh, managed to share my screen by the meantime we had already the first question that you can also pose uh, the first one was uh, are the uh, slides going to be shared yes uh, you're going to have uh, 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 the slides available later on and uh, uh, also the recording will be available uh, in in the next coming uh, in the next few days uh could i please ask uh, for my slides to be uh, put uh, put on the screen i have some technical difficulties to showing it uh from my own uh but yeah in the meantime uh what we wanted to give you as, as an introduction from from our side uh, we have here a couple of uh, uh very variety of different companies the topic is quite uh, thank you the topic is quite quite uh, wide so we're going to cover a lot of things so as part of that I'm, i wanted to throw also a couple other let's say food for thought uh, so as part of this whole discussion on digitalization and and, uh, and operation maintenance uh, one thing that we wanted to take a closer look was uh, in in fact the age of of wind turbines in europe uh, what we noticed and we've been saying this for years now uh, we have a very growing uh, uh, growing onshore fleet in Europe, uh, which we need to uh, really address. We need to uh, make sure that uh, those assets uh, continue working, that they get either repowered or lifetime extended. Uh, and here you you see in fact how it looks uh, how it looks per per different uh, age categories in different countries. So in Germany, by far uh, the biggest player uh, here. Uh, but also we have significant capacity in Denmark, France, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, and the UK. We expect some 26 gigawatts uh, to become older than 20 years or the next five years. Uh, and then there, there is still uh, capacity that's older than that. So we have around 10 gigawatts that are going to become 25 years old over the next five years and 1.5 gigawatts becoming 30 years old. So there's a lot of capacity here in Europe that uh, uh, we need to basically decide should we repower it, uh, extend its lifetime, or decommission it. So in total, that's 38 gigawatts uh, that we talk about. And what we've been telling policymakers is that uh, you should look at this very carefully. Uh, for example, we took Austria in 2020. They had net negative installations of, of uh, wind capacity because they decommissioned more than they commissioned. So they decommissioned 64 megawatts for a total of 25 megawatts. So in order not, uh, not that to happen, we wanted to also uh, stress the importance of, uh, uh, of end of life and uh, what, we, what we see here. Now, if we can go to the next slide, uh, for those listening and not seeing the chart, the chart has a lot, of, a lot of different colors, a lot of different lines. Uh, what we wanted to show in short here was that uh, uh, from a perspective, of of OMs, so turbine manufacturers, uh, we see uh, that operation maintenance is becoming much bigger uh, revenue stream for them, and at the same time, it's it's a way for them to increase increase margins. So so the margins is actually increasing uh, for for services, uh, while for uh, the wind turbines we have decreasing margins as uh, uh, we move to a more competitive environment. Uh, uh, where we have auctions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, O and M is a very important part for uh, from a O and M point of view. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, another chart from a now third uh, third publication uh, that that Wind Europe has from our wind turbine orders monitoring report, where we took a look at at onshore mm, onshore orders, uh, excluding aircon orders, uh, because we were looking only at uh, publicly available uh, deals uh, we saw also also interesting trend which was that uh, 
throughout the last few years, uh, the O&M deals that are being signed with uh, with O&Ms uh, between developers and O&Ms uh, are becoming much longer. Uh, so in 2019, we already had 30-year deals being signed on Shorewin. We had it also now in 2020, and we see really lately that uh, this is ex uh, extending. So we we didn't see uh, any below 10 years uh, O&M deals uh, being announced. Uh, we are more moving towards 20 years and above. Uh, so just just to give you uh, let's say a food for thought now for, for this discussion when we start, uh, when, when our presenters uh, are going to start with their presentations. Uh, this is, of course, only one small part of the, of the picture. So uh, we talked here more about, about O&Ms to make, to make some, uh, some introduction, uh, but there is much more than, than uh, O&Ms. Uh, there are operation maintenance deals that are being signed. It's, it's a market uh, of its own. Uh, but uh, focusing now on digitalization and, and digitalization can play a very important part in operation and maintenance. Uh, I give the floor to uh, uh, Marco Busetalo, head of global O&M uh, wind predictive maintenance at NL Green Power uh, to talk a bit about data and people driven maintenance uh, in his presentation. Thank you very much, Ivan, for the introduction. I hope you can see my screen. Um, so um, it's well, it's a pleasure being here with you to talk about the digitalization and just to lay the ground for the presentation that are uh, coming right after me and also for the presentation that we were seeing in the September's webinar. I will talk a little bit more about the, uh, how maintenance is changing with this uh, new approach that is based on data, but is also based on, on people. So just to uh, to start on uh, with uh, Enel. So who's Enel? Well, Enel is a, a multinational that uh, is active in the electricity sector, mainly in these uh, five main areas: the global infrastructure network, global trading, retail, uh, NLX that's covering services and and customers, and then global power generation with a strong focus on renewable energy. Of course, that is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but if I had to choose a way to describe Enel, probably I would go with this one, with utility as a platform. Uh, just because in the this 4.0 environment, the platform is the place where the, the input meets the output and the supply meets the demand. And in this case, the sources meet the users. The, by the way, I, I know more users, I'm more uh, prosumers somehow interacting and exchanging information with the, with the platform itself. So uh, keep in mind this platform world because in a while we will see it again. If we uh, want to have a look at operation and maintenance for uh, the renewable sector uh, for Enel, we can see here a chart with uh, more or less 49 gigawatt installed in the six main technologies in 23 countries, five continents, and then filtering this same chart for the wind technology, we can see uh, that we're close to the 15 gigawatt in 14 countries. Um, and if I had to choose a couple of numbers to better describe what's wind for, for energy green power, uh, I would take probably as first this number here, because as we just seen in the Ivan presentation, uh, we have very very different fleets uh, in our uh, in our uh, in our perimeter. Like for example, this one. I mean, the only thing these two wind turbines have in common probably is just a set of three blades. Period. So the, the entire maintenance needs to change also to um, keep track and keep the pace with this huge change that we're experiencing also in the asset uh, uh, point of view. And then the, the second number I would focus on is the uh, bottom right one, that 490 NM people, because inside NL, this means sort of 4% of the organization, you know, NM, that is handling and managing 16% of the capacity installed. Uh, and probably this, this is a difference that will be even bigger in the next future um, because the, actually this is not only NL, this is the market. 
This is a, a study uh, presented by Irene a couple of years ago, where you can perfectly see how the number of people per megawatt is decreasing in time. So it's a, that difference will be uh, bigger, not because we will have less people, but because the growth in megawatt will be far bigger than the growth in terms of people uh, managing that fleet. So uh, that's good. Of course, we have to take into account that the wind turbines will be bigger. Uh, the geographical optimization takes place. Also that offshore wind farms uh, don't have any people on site normally. So that's uh, a trend that we have to consider and actually is the main reason why we have to push digitalization. And that's the reason why, for example, in Enel, we uh, started with this new data-driven approach, uh, moving from the time-based maintenance towards uh, condition and risk-based maintenance through the data. That, in other words, means also to uh, move maintenance from an uh, asset-independent maintenance towards an asset-dependent. So uh, taking into account the actual behavior of the asset. So it's not either one or the other, of course, it's a transient that we have to consider and actually that we patented also. Um, but it's a key factor to start using data to change maintenance. So one example of data, of course, uh, is the set of SCADA signals that we have, uh, temperatures, pressures, power outputs. And if we analyze all of them, uh, probably we can reach uh, a new approach to monitor, which is the health status of the different assets. But in the actually in the green box, I, I would stop just a, a few seconds because we hear a lot about uh, machine learning, huge neural network applied for all the sensors. Probably that that's not exactly the best scenario. Uh, a wind turbine is not. Uh, such a complicated machine. The complexity is added by the environmental condition that is affecting the behavior. Also some components that are not uh, so easy to handle, but uh, machine learning, even simple machine learning algorithms sometimes are uh, enough to analyze at least the basics. Uh, a random forest can be enough. It's true that neural network, a simple neural network is needed sometimes but the most important part from my perspective is the physical models that we need to add uh, on the table. So if we don't know how a component is behaving because of the physics behind and the design of that component, there's no way we can get to the perfect result. So this hybrid approach is a key factor to being able to move to this new maintenance. And so now the, the question is, we've talked about SCADA data, but is this enough? Uh, from my point of view, the uh, answer is in this chart, the, the DIPF curve that basically is health status versus time, where SCADA analysis is more or less here. So very, very close to the failure. So we can detect the last problems. So what we what we need to do is to consider also other inputs and move this box to the left. And if we move to the extreme left, actually there's this design phase quality. And it's important to start considering the design phase an enabler for the digitalization. Otherwise there's no way we can get there. And this is one, one important thing. So uh, considering design and quality and the different inputs, we can start talking about data with a different perspective because, okay, we have the SCADA signals, but we also have vibrations, blade inspections, lubricants, just to mention some of them. And somehow we need to transform this data into information for the people that are on site because those will be the people that will transform again the information into the knowledge through their experience and the NM records that we do need to have in a, a CMMS, for example, or stored because this is not the way we can close the loop in the maintenance, receiving the feedback, 
but also it's the only way we can improve maintenance because the experience we, the experience we have on site is a key factor to improve so here you can start seeing the platform taking place where the user is exchanging information with the uh, with the sources and the tools and just to give you a quick view uh, we have on a map uh, one power plant uh, in in the Annals fleet uh, it's not even the biggest one but it's 20 kilometer wide so uh, 20 kilometers means that in by car you it can take uh, up to an hour to get from one turbine in one side to, uh, to the other side which also means that we don't only have to consider what we need to do and where we need to do but also how long it will take to get to the point where we have to perform maintenance so for example if we look at which is the health of the asset knowing that 26 percent in the winter buying two for example is a key factor because we can plan in a different way the maintenance knowing which is the actual behavior of the asset and so this drives uh, directly to the second and last question because what about people well i went through the job descriptions uh in the last seven years more or less and at the beginning of this story uh, a technician on site was uh, expected to have um, uh, industrial and technical skills to be physically fit and so uh, people that were working on field directly and manually uh, then little by little it moved to flexibility resilience and also being company ambassador uh, but the change from my perspective happened a couple of years ago when we started talking about the IT skills communication able to read the data able to support that feedback culture we were talking about before and so it's becoming more what in the market is known as the nomad that it, in my opinion is a sort of a MacGyver of our wind farm so being able to cover different things so basically this is no more innovation this is the maintenance in the business as usual new eyes and new hands for our technicians new tools to perform inspections and just as a last important point uh, from uh, for me, uh, I believe that this chart from McKinsey is uh, uh, a very good example on how we have to consider the change, because uh, McKinsey says that uh, we have three main areas: business, technology, and organization. And only where these three main areas intersect, we can have a digital change. There is where digital change happens. And this same message actually is also uh, proposed by uh, Parag Khanna, this international relations specialist, which said that the geotechnology is driving change in, in our century. It was geopolitics in 19th century. It was geoeconomics in the last one. It is geotechnology in, in our century. And digital leaders must be fluent in these three languages. And I like very much the word language here because this is not only the way you can um, express yourself or uh, express the knowledge to communicate, but it's also a way to describe society and organization. So if the entire organization is not aligned towards uh, the same goal, there's no way we can get digitalization in our wind farms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco, for uh, for explaining to us this uh, general trend in wind operation and maintenance towards more data-driven approaches and, and how this is transforming the, the, the wind business uh, since, since some years now. But you also highlighted something very important that uh, it's very important to deploy all these digital tools hand in hand with, uh, with physical models. So now uh, Eduardo will, uh, will take a deep, a deep technical dive into, um, into uh, another, as you called it, hybrid approach, not for operation and maintenance this time, but for uh, uh, model validation for uh, wind turbine converters for grid compliance. So Eduardo, the floor is yours. That's it. Thank you very much, Vasiliki. And thank you, Marco, for the presentation. 
I'm going to to go to the to the other extreme, let's say, of the, the curve that Marco showed. Right, because I'm shifting from Marco's view from the O&M point of view to a design point of view from the converter controller point of view, okay? Approached purely from the technical, technical side of it, from the design phase of it. So maybe in order to contextualize, uh, I must say that uh, I'm speaking from the wind power converter division in the team. And uh, although maybe, you know, in getting from some other products, I will be focused purely on the uh, controller of the power converter, okay? And the presentation will be focused on the validation of this uh, converter controller. Mm, keeping in mind three main ideas related to this validation, which will be the, the procedure that we are using to have this uh, converter controller validated, the target systems that we are facing as of today, the target system that we are using today to validate this controller, and the correlation of results, which is uh, really important between the different target systems in order to have a, a reliable uh, model of the component itself that we will see that it's very important for uh, the studies on, on wide areas as a grid integration and all this kind of Mm, more than component studies, okay. So uh, to give an, an overview of how we use the, um, how we define the framework development procedure, I want to show you these uh, four steps, five steps, sorry, that uh, we define inside our framework development procedure. This is only a snippet of the full procedure and is based on a standard V model of software development, but I want to show this to uh, highlight where the, the validation takes place and where the target systems are used, okay? So we have basically three steps where the validation takes place. The first one is the definition of the requirements, which is essential, and the introduction of these requirements in the in a specific tool. And then we have uh, two steps where we uh, run all the simulations on both software in the loop, which is uh, referred to as SIL, and hardware in the loop platforms, which will be referred as HIL. Okay. Uh, we do type tests for individually, individual functions, and then we perform always a serial or routine validation for every firmware release. Okay. I want to show this so that uh, everybody has in mind that what I will show next it will be applied in these three steps. Okay, so um, the first step, uh, as I said, is the test definition and execution of the of the validation process. Okay, and uh, for this step, we found that it's uh, essential to use a, a test environment or a tool that helps uh, helps helps us record uh, the requirements which help us uh, process these uh, requirements into tests and to execute this test in the target system and uh, obtain the, the desired results, okay? I want to highlight at this point that uh, in this case, we have used, uh, we have developed our own uh, testing tool, but there are commercially available tools. But I want to highlight the importance that uh, in our case, the tool is able to launch the exact same test in different platforms, okay? Because uh, the basis of this presentation and the base of this presentation is that we will run the exact same tests in both a hardware in the loop to uh, check the controller inside the hardware in the loop system in real time. And we will launch the exact same test at the same time in a software in the loop platform to validate the, let's say, the digital model of the converter the library file or DLL as some of you may, may know it, okay? So I want to highlight that this, uh, these three steps are essential and it's really important that they are uh, automated. There is uh, as little human interaction as possible in order to have a great traceability of all the tests and all the results, okay? Once that we have a, 
redefine the tool that we will use and once that we have a set of tests that uh, we need to run in the controller in order to validate it, we need to define which digest systems we need to to validate the, the system on, okay? Because uh, initially, what I want to show in this slide is that uh, initially from the converter design point of view, um, the hill system, the hardware develop system is used purely as the controller hardware validation and the library element for the converter controller was used uh, purely for the EMT electromagnetic transient simulations of the electric systems and valid internal validation of uh, the behavior of the converter. Uh, therefore, in the past, we had uh, different tools for these two uh, validation processes as we thought that they were uh, independent, but um, more and more, well, it's uh, also state of the art that OEMs are already using the libraries from the converter and also other components. But in this case, I'm talking from the converter point of view, the libraries from the converter for the EMT simulations. And we are uh, seeing that more and more uh, grid utilities, the TSOs or DSOs even, uh, are also shifting from RNS models to uh, EMT simulations, electromagnetic transients, okay? Because when going to uh, grid stability issues, uh, it's uh, not enough with the simplifications that an, an RMS model uh, regarding the wind turbine and the power converter in particular, uh, it's not enough to reproduce a uh, grid stability issues. So we have seen that this uh, converter component library is not being used uh, only in the converter design, it's not being used only in the turbine design, but it's also being used by uh, other grid integration uh, studies by other companies, grid utilities, DSOs or TSOs. Okay. We have seen this case uh, in countries as uh, Australia, in the US, or in, in China, where it is required to have a high detailed uh, EMT model, which implies a highly detailed um, converter twin or converter component, so that uh, grid integration studies are, are detailed enough. Okay. So once that we have this in mind, we decided that all the tests have to be run in both systems to have an equivalent of the converter controller in, in the digital world, okay. Um, the procedure that comes next is very, it's quite state of the art, okay. It's basically the seal simulation where you, we have the original code of our controller that is compiled into both worlds, okay, into the convert controller firmware and into a library company, which is the, the DLL5. Okay. So the target systems will be the software in the loop system with the library component, where we have the electrical model and a library component comprising all the systems inside our controller. Okay. All the original code is inside these components. And uh, this allows us to have a, a, a library component to give our customers. Okay. And uh, on the other hand, we compile it, of course, for the final product, which is our converter. And uh, we used a hill system, which is this one that you are looking at the left side, to validate the controller itself, okay, where we can connect the controller to the hill system and uh, test not only the, the code itself, but the integration with the full hardware of the controller, the behavior of them, all the microprocessors, interaction between the buses, etc. Okay. Um, so, once that we have uh, both systems uh, targeted and clear, um, the tool that we developed allows us to, uh, well, it's the tool that we developed, but as I said, we can use any other commercial tool, okay? Allows us to run the exact same cases, the exact same test cases in both platforms so that we can check that the results are uh, equivalent one to the other. How would we check that? Uh, we do it by a post-processing stage after all the tests have been run. We run a post-processing with the exact same uh, tolerance values and uh, acceptance criteria 
for the seal results and heal results. And therefore, we can run the same case. In this case, it's uh, case three. We run it in seal simulation. We run it in heal. Then we post process all the results so that we can uh, check that the tolerances are met for both systems. It gives us the certainty that the library component that will be used by third parties is equivalent to the controller firmware that is validated on the HIL system. Okay. Mm, this, uh, well, we run a very large set of uh, tests. This, in this case, is a steady state test. We also run a, a dynamic uh, test, in this case, an HVRT test, and the comparison between a library component and controller firmware. I forgot to say that the electrical model in both targets is always the same. So the the only thing that changes is the the controller. In one, the hill system is the controller, the hardware controller, and in the seal simulation is the library component. Therefore, we can uh, correlate the results and see that uh, have confident have confidence that the component that we are giving to our customers uh, represents uh, truthfully the controller that we are installing in our in our converters okay so with uh, this in mind uh, we can be sure that from the design phase we can trust this uh, let's say digital equivalent of our controller for future tests and for uh, reintegration studies to sum up what i've uh, said uh, i want to highlight four key points in order to have this uh, validation procedure applied. Uh, the first one is the validation needs to be automatic. And this is essential from our point of view and no human interaction to reduce human errors. The heal testing is required for the full control, control characterization. Without the heal system, we wouldn't be able to compare directly uh, with a seal simulations and to validate the library component. Um, we, we could do this by using uh, field data, but the goal of all this uh, validation procedure is to avoid using, uh, to avoid having to go to field uh, testing to validate the controller. And therefore, the health system will feel that is essential nowadays for this task. Another key point is that uh, the controller library component must be highly detailed, must be a truthful representation of the controller in order to be able to do grid integration studies. Even a slight uh, difference between both can lead to uh, wrong results on the grid integration studies. And uh, the last key point is that uh, it's no use doing uh, the validation of the library component on one side and, and for the controller component on the other side because uh, they must behave the same. So we should target both systems at the same time. We think that this is essential. And uh, yeah, this is my presentation for today. And thank you very much. I will be happy to answer further questions in the Q&A term. Thank you very much, Eduardo. It's uh, very interesting to see how um, how standard processes are are evolving over time, uh, thanks to new capabilities, new new technologies. And uh, now Joseba will uh, will present another uh, another um, application of digital twins. And this time, it's about uh, how these how digital twins can be used to validate changes in the control of uh, of uh, of a wind farm. So, uh, Joseba, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, am I sharing my screen? Yeah, okay, we can so, see. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is a great, uh, this is a great uh, presentation today from Marco and Eduardo. I hope to be at the same level. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about how to validate the changes on wind farm control with digital twins. Um, I'm Josep Arripa, Head of Solutions Management for UL Renewables. For those that don't know UL, uh, UL is a global leader for testing, certification, and technical advisory services to grant um, global market access and bankability to products, systems, and, and projects. 
and we mainly focus on on safety sustainability and, and performance and basically we have developed a, a, a myriad of services like those you you see here in the screen testing inspection and certification of turbines and components we do wind and solar resource we do due diligence uh, to make sure we our clients can can get the necessary bankability of their projects grid code compliance uh, we have uh, services for operational performance assessment structural integrity lifetime extension uh, we have talked about that in, in previous uh, webinars uh, and other services digital solutions we have a lot of interesting products like open wind wind door affair and some others that i will be happy to catch up with uh, uh, the attendees uh, and review those those services so let me go to well uh, basically just to finish uh, the presentation about UL, uh, we are present in, in more than 140 countries. We have uh, evaluated uh, more than 200,000 megawatts in, in the world, and we have been technical advisor for more than 90% of, of the global project developers, plant owners. So I think we we are clearly one of the of the global market leaders in, in technical advisory and digital solutions. So today, I'm going to focus on wind farm and wind turbines control. So very, I mean, the, the presentation uh, it's uh, quite generic. I think can be understood by everybody, hopefully. Um, basically, uh, what I'm going to explain is that many of current uh, plant owners are looking for new ways of uh, squeezing or maximizing the production of their plants, especially on on, on old wind farms. And this is by means of uh, changing uh, the SCADA, changing the, the control of the turbine. Uh, turbines um, and the the main aim of uh, working on, on the control of wind farms and wind turbines is making sure th that the wind turbine can produce at the lowest possible cost so minimum minimum price per megawatt hour so there are three main dimensions here one is maximizing the production by means of optimization techniques the second is reducing the structural loads which at the end will mean reducing the opex and the third uh, important uh, dimension is improving integration to secure stability, uh, reliability, and quality uh, on the electrical uh, power to, to uh, reduce grid connection costs. But as you see, the three of them are related to increase production while you decrease the cost of doing that, right? So which are the reasons why owners are looking for these ways of uh, to optimize the control plants? The first one is energy price variability so because many of the older feeding tariffs are expiring while we also are seeing many PP ppas coming into into the arena the reality is that many uh, plants are still uh, depending on the spot market price and and this implies a lot of variability on on the revenues for for the for the plant so in somehow this change on control is connected to uh, control the control in, in the same way that conventional power plants can do right so this is one idea uh, one of the reasons uh, to to weigh in to look into the uh, optimizing the control the second one is uh, optimizing the production as the global market is becoming more and more competitive there are many developers new owners uh, there are tenders in which everyone is is really uh, playing with their tools to make sure they can win the tenders, they can really develop their, their plants. And at the end of the day, this means squeezing assets uh, uh, to, to make sure that they can produce all they can uh, in a safe way, right? The third point I mentioned before is uh, adapting to new grid codes. Uh, in many of the European countries, uh, grid codes are being adapted to make sure that uh, renewables are uh, achieve higher penetrability to uh, make sure the decarbonization of the of the economy and this implies that uh, wind turbines have to collaborate somehow on the voltage and frequency uh, regulation to make sure that these grid codes are complied and finally uh, there is extended life cycles uh, as we all know uh, life extension is playing a role and with this lifetime extension uh, many old plants are using old controllers and with those all controllers, uh, owners are super limited in, in the things they can do with the plant. So if 
uh, the wind farm owner is affected by those reasons, they are starting thinking, okay, how can I change my controllers? How can I incorporate knowledge to make sure that I can maximize the production of, of my plant, right? So there are four steps uh, because, well, uh, actuating on, on the control generates substantial risks and then a, a robust mitigation plan for those risks is needed. And this plan is based on four main pillars. One is design the control strategy, the best control strategy. Number two, modeling this control strategy uh, and see what are the possible consequences of this simulation. The third is validation of, of the assumptions and the model. And the fourth uh, main uh, step is monitoring. So let me go quickly over the three, over the four steps, which will be the, the content of, of this presentation. So number one, designing the optimal control strategy. I am representing here many. Uh, this doesn't mean those are the only ones. There are many others. Uh, you see here, I'm, I'm trying to describe for each of them the impact, uh, which in green means they are generally positive or generally negative, but for most, uh, in, especially when we look into the loads or the structural integrity, uh, these changes in the control strategy imply uh, that they require evaluation because the impact is not defined. Okay, so there are things like power up, power down, wind sector management optimization, wake steering by yawing or pitching, blade extenders, which increase the area uh, of, of the rotor, LIDAR assisted control for the turbines, individual pitch control for turbines which uh, are pitch control, uh, watchdog optimization for extreme loads optimization uh, control, uh, fixed to variable uh, rotor uh, speed, grid code compliance, lifetime management, each of them have a different degree of complexity uh, and each of them have a different impact uh, in terms of production and in terms of uh, structural integrity, as I said. And some of them, uh, with the color code, some of them imply pure control uh, changes or they some of them may include hardware and some are just focused on wake management. But as you see, uh, owners can really uh, play in this uh, playground of, of control strategy with a lot of different options and the the what i well, what i will try to explain today is how can we mitigate the risks of changing whatever in the wind farm by using digital twins uh, as part of of the mitigation plan so these digital twins uh, this is step number two is the modeling we use digital twins so the digital twins are composed of very well characterization of the wind inputs with the wind speed, turbulence intensity, wind shear, inflow, air density, and yaw misalignment. A digital twin, which is uh, equivalent, uh, a representation in terms of dimensions, geometries, materials, weights, stiffness, and control mode for the turbine. And finally, with that in place, you can do load simulations, time series, time series gener generation to uh, obtain the markup matrices, the damage equivalent loads, and uh, not only uh, looking to fatigue, but also extreme loads. So with these digital twins, you can do a simulation of what will happen if I do, for example, whatever, increasing the rated power of the turbine, what will be the consequence if I increase 100 kilowatts rated power of the turbine, okay? So once we have the system to do the modeling and a UL model, UL's model are, are really uh, uh, broadly used in the, in the global industry, um the next step is validation if you remember but the validation the optimal validation is done by uh, a mechanical loads testing campaign which uh, requires uh, the design of the campaign the installation of some sensors strain gauges accelerometers meteorological signals and so on the setup with the installation cabling connection and calibration it takes like around two to three weeks to have the complete system running and finally the campaign um, we normally use toggle tests. Uh, this means that there is a shifting between the old control and the new control, a 30 minute shifting. So you can check with the same wind distributions, what are the consequences of uh, uh, changing the control on the turbine. And then you can compare the results with what uh, uh, the result of your simulations to validate the control, to validate the system, and make sure that you can have a very good understanding of what will be the uncertainty on this evaluation. So with this validation uh, and with this system that can uh, can stay in the turbine after the campaign, you can really have 
a very good analysis of how this digital twin is, is behaving in terms of modeling because then you can use the same model the same digital twin for other wind farms which are which are of, of the same wind turbine model okay uh, so the last uh, step uh, very important in our point of view is monitoring uh, once you change uh, the control on a wind farm it is super important that you are able to monitor during the following years how is this affecting the production how is this affecting uh, the structural integrity so this robust monitoring is key to feed uh, um, optimal analysis through the period in which uh, this uh, control new control mode will be in place for us the most important areas that we need to take care of are first the performance so very important to understand power curves uh, plotting power curves is not as simple as just uh, plotting uh, power versus wind speed you need to filter you need to normalize you need to do many things to make sure that your uh, power curves are accurately representing the real impact in performance second very important point is the impact on availability the same thing availability is not as simple as getting a status uh, signal you really need to go to the ic 13 or 14 uh, availability categories time base energy base make sure that your system is really able to detect depending on the uh, each uh, alarm categorization which availability status is involved the third very important point is a recategorization of all the losses that you have in the wind farm for uh, for, for that we use the the waterfall uh, analysis to make sure that we are able to character, uh, characterize every loss and finally super important as well is all the correlation with intersected variables to make sure that uh, you are, are able to understand the sensitivity uh, to um, critical parameters like wind speed power geo misalignment pitch angle rpms or whatever because some control changes can be unstable so this sensitivity is really key is crucial because if the if the control change is unstable and you, and and some parameters are changing slightly from from the original assumption then the impact in in some of the or the consequence in in terms of structural integrity or production can be huge so with that i'm finished hopefully giving a few minutes for q a uh, just want to remind everyone four main steps on um, on control changes uh, design very well your strategy uh, uh, model this, that the strategy by means of digital twins uh, validate that with a mechanical loads campaign and monitor during the, the period of implementation and later on uh, the consequence on the production and structural integrity ul will be really happy to support you uh, with these four steps on on your on your process thank you very much uh, josepa so uh, while we during the presentations the, the the chat has been very active uh, with questions so maybe i will uh, i will start with a question to you um, and uh, i mean maybe a double question in fact so I, want, I wanted to ask you, you, you just uh, presented uh, the, the deployment of a digital twin to, to, to do this model validation uh, process. How precise um, is this approach compared to the models by the, um, the manufacturers of the technology? And then mm -hmm. knowing this, um, if, if maybe there are any, any data, any statistical data um, proving how much if you can save opex or capex by deploying such such approach for example mm -hmm. compared yeah, to others that may exist or yeah to the first question uh, the, the the digital models were really something uh, which was uh, proper uh, intellectual property of oems during years and this was a barrier for the implementation of of many of those things for owners the technology is evolving and now we have the capability to to have independent aeroelastic models at the beginning those models i want to be uh, honest uh, were not so precise but after at least in our side in ul after three four years working to refine the models with calibrations and validations we think we have uh, acquired a very uh, high level of precision very close to oem uh, a proprietary model and, and to the second question um this uh, let's say these control strategies uh, can really improve significantly 
the um, the return of investment on 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 the plant uh, if you play well uh, on on the different areas performance availability uh, opex and so on you can easily uh, target around 10% of increase by uh, having a very very robust uh, um, control strategy uh, which is very well implemented and of course uh, this requires um, good assessment and, and the use of, of good technology uh, and digital uh, digital tools. 10% in availability or revenues? What, no, in, in total, it's a, in total, uh, you can increase the, the the gains in terms of incremental okay. revenues plus incremental yeah. savings okay. plus mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, reduce of, of costs by mm -hmm. around 10% in, in, in optimal cases. Okay, thank you very much. So we have we have a couple of minutes left. We won't take it too long, but we can still do uh, a question each for Marco and, and uh, Eduardo. So Marco, for you again, as Vasiliki also said, uh, a double question. I'm going to put combined two from the chat. Please try to answer it, uh, let's say, within a minute if it's possible. So the question was more of, of the benefits of digitalization on CAPEX and OPEX uh, that you see at uh, Green Power, you know, what increases, what decreases, what's the, uh, how do you see it there? And at the same time, another question, and then you can choose how to answer it, or do you do want to answer one question or, or, or the other, uh, was that a, a good uh, O&M strategy does have a combination of, of numerical models and, and let's say on the field, uh inspection data uh ha how do you see those two being uh, being combined and now uh, jose javier now mentioned a very nice example but do you have perhaps anything else to add on that well i, I will start with the second one because it it's a good hint for the first and i believe that uh, um having the inputs from the inspection is a key factor because the all the inputs that we may have from sensors or real time are not enough normally to define 100 percent which is the the full picture of the situation in an asset so uh, merging them together is not only uh, a suggestion it is also a, a key factor to succeed in the definition of what's health and um, so uh, that that's a key factor and also the reason why normally the um, organization is more decentralized than centralized if you have strong standardization and, and tools uh, in place. And uh, talking about the CAPEX and OPEX, of course, it depends a lot on the maintenance strategy uh, you have in place. Uh, with the strong digitalization, uh, you can, of course, reduce both, but not immediately. So it's not a sudden decrease. Normally, you have to consider in the transition towards the normal maintenance, towards the digitalized maintenance, this data-driven approach, you have to consider probably an increase in both, and then uh, you can see the the huge uh, benefit that you can gain. Thank you very much. And maybe a last question for uh, Eduardo. So the, the question is, you, you presented a, a validation approach. The, can this actually replace um, on-site uh, converter uh, certification campaigns? Well, um, thank you for the question. As of today, it cannot it cannot replace it because at the very last step, a certification is required for the whole turbine to be tested on-site. And uh, although there are uh, hmm, countries that uh, through their agricoles and technical guidelines uh, allow the turbine manufacturer to validate a, a model for further certifications the initial one uh, has always have to be on site because you need to gather data in order to validate the models that uh, uh, have been used for design so uh, not as, as a first step that would be a question. But maybe in the future? We hope so, yes. Yeah. We, we can characterize every component one by one uh, and we can justify that. We expect mm -hmm. it to be, to be a possibility, yes. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Joseba. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Vasiliki. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us here. Uh, we finished one minute too late, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of interesting topics. We could have done it much longer. I invite you to register for our uh, for our uh, workshop that's going to be in September. Uh, might get uh, more details in these topics, might uh, learn something uh, about others. Overall, uh, looking forward to uh, hosting another uh, uh, webinar, another workshop like this. Uh, hope you enjoyed. If you had any questions, policy at windeurope.org. Uh, and I wish you a very nice, very nice remainder of the day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.